morning. So some believers, many pastors, and even some scholars will tell you that the apostles left no structural plan for the church, that anything goes and anything went. Well, personally, I find that idea a little offensive. I mean, do we really think that God didn't have a plan for the successful administration of his worldwide church? Today, we're going to take a walk together through early church documents, beginning with the book of Acts, and we'll see how the apostles developed the ministry of the church after Christ ascended to heaven. This is going to be a little different sermon than usual. You're going to want your Bible for sure today. If you didn't bring one and you don't have a phone app, if you'll raise your hand and hold it up, one of the elders will bring you a Bible to use today. Come on, don't be shy. You all brought your Bible? Okay, I'm telling you, I'm not putting it on the slide, so you're going to be really, okay. Really about 60, 70% of the sermon today is just reading Scripture together, so it's a little different. If you have a Bible, turn to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 1, verse 13. I hate to tell Scott that there's another problem in this building, but one of those fans is making a lot of noise. (laughs) If it falls on my head, I'm going to be very unhappy. (laughs) Acts chapter 1, verse 13. This is right after Christ ascended to heaven. It says, When they entered Jerusalem, they went to the upstairs room where they were staying. Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James, were there. All these continued together in prayer with one mind, together with the women disciples, along with Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up and spoke among the believers. So this is the start of the church. All the believers, men and women, who were willing to wait on the Holy Spirit as Jesus had directed, were together. Men and women. Now, who's noted as being there? You see, the apostles are named, right? And then it also mentions the family of Jesus. Who spoke as a leader in that moment? Peter, one of the apostles. Look down at verse 21. Peter was speaking and he said, Thus... One of the men who have accompanied us during all the time the Lord Jesus associated with us, beginning from his baptism by John until the day he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness of his resurrection together with us to replace Judas Iscariot. So they proposed two candidates, Joseph, called Barsabbas, also called Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed, Lord, you know the hearts of all. Show us which one of these two you have chosen to assume the task of this service and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. Then they cast lots for them, and the one chosen was Matthias. So he was counted with the eleven apostles. It was important to replace that lost apostle so they would have a spiritual co-leader as a witness to the truth of their teaching about Jesus and as a servant to do the ministry work that Christ had given them. And from all this that we've read so far, we can see the apostles were the acknowledged leaders of the group in the upper room, and that they felt it was important to replace Judas to carry on ministry work, uh, ministry leadership. Turn to chapter 2, verse 14. Once the Holy Spirit had come upon the disciples, they went out in public. We studied this before, right? They went out there in public speaking in foreign languages and being understood by Jews from those foreign lands. And this confused the non-believing Jews. So we see in chapter 2, verse 14, I'm only taking a part of the verse, Peter stood up with the eleven, that is the other apostles, raised his voice and addressed them. So again, the apostles, led by Peter, addressed the crowd at Pentecost to explain that we now were in the end times that had been promised 
by the Old Testament prophets. And that Jesus was the Messiah Savior promised by those prophets. Scroll down to verse 41. After Peter explained what was happening and that the Jews should accept Jesus as the Messiah Savior, we see in verse 41, So those who accepted his message were baptized. And that day about 3,000 people were added. They were devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Reverential awe came over everyone. And many wonders and miraculous signs came about by the apostles. So that morning... They had 120 people in their church, and now they had over 3,000. Now, I'll, I'll be honest with you. When I pray for this church to grow, I'm not quite thinking on that scale, all right? But suppose God wanted to do that. Would we take it? Yeah, because God would empower us, right, for whatever he wants us to handle. So they went from 120 to 3,120 in one day. How did the apostles respond to this ministry challenge? Well, we see here they began to teach sound doctrine to all the people in the church. And they also were doing miracles. And based on what we read about some of those miracles later in the New Testament, I think those were related to doing evangelism. It was showing the power of Christ in order to authenticate the ministry message of Christ. Turn to chapter 4, verse 33. Chapter 4, verse 33, it says, With great power the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was on them all, that is, those in the church. For there was no one needy among them, because those who were owners of land or houses were selling them and bringing the proceeds from the sales and placing them at the apostles' feet. The proceeds were distributed to each as anyone had need. So within the church, everyone's accepting that the apostles are in authority under Christ and that the apostles could administrate over the ministry. They're putting all that money at the feet of the apostles, giving them control. Now turn to chapter 5, verse 17. It says, Now the high priest rose up, and all those with him, that is the religious party of the Sadducees, and they were filled with jealousy, They laid hands on the apostles and put them in a public jail. So just like inside the church, those outside the church, in this case the Jewish religious leaders, acknowledged the apostles were in authority in the church and therefore should be held accountable for what was happening in the Jesus movement. Okay, now turn to chapter 6. Chapter 6, verse 1. It says, Now, in those days when the disciples were growing in number, a complaint arose on the part of the Greek-speaking Jews against the native Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve, that's the apostles, called the whole group of disciples, the church, together and said, It's not right for us to neglect the word of God to wait on tables, but carefully select from among you, brothers, seven men who are well attested, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this necessary task. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. So here we see the first signs of stress as the church grows, right? Thousands have joined the church, but there's still only 12 men essentially running the whole thing. At first... All they had to do was teach and pray, evangelize, and so they could pretty much do it all. And anything else that happened, such as eating together and taking care of the needy, was just happening what we now say organically, just as the Holy Spirit led individuals to act. But now there's a problem. We see the first sign of dissension in the church over the care that different ethnic groups of widows were receiving. But we see again the apostles were in authority and nobody's questioning that. They received the complaint, they called a meeting of the church, and they decided how to handle this problem. And look what they said about their own role in ministry. They wanted to remain focused on prayer and teaching the Word of God, which would include evangelism because that's just teaching the gospel truth. 
The apostles now were officially delegating some ministry authority and responsibility to other respected spiritual leaders in the church to resolve this issue and ensure that all the widows received the care that they needed. And this is important because it's the first delegation of responsibility that we know about by the apostles. These seven leaders in Jerusalem would still be under the authority of the apostles, but now they would also have authority from the apostles to take care of the responsibilities that they had also received from the apostles. Look at chapter 8, verse 14. Okay, it says, Now when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. These two went down and prayed for them so that they would receive the Holy Spirit. For the Spirit had not yet come upon any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on the Samaritans, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now, you might recall that the Samaritans were a mixed race of people. They were part Jewish, part Gentile. And they'd been living separate in faith and in society from the pure race Jews for hundreds of years, even though Samaria is smack in the middle of the traditional borders of the promised land of Israel. When an evangelist from among the disciples went to the Samaritans and led some of them to faith in Christ and baptized them in water... The apostles went to certify that the church was indeed open to these people who traditionally were enemies of the Jews. So there's three things we want to note here. First of all, there were non-apostles doing evangelism, right? Regular disciples in the church were doing evangelism. Second, even so, the apostles still had authority. And in this case, they went to certify the work of the evangelist. And third, that the church was now open to both Jews and and Samaritans. In chapter 10, we see God send one apostle, Peter, to certify that the church also is open to Gentiles. That would be most of us who are 100% non-Jewish. Turn to chapter 9, verse 17. Acts chapter 9, verse 17. It says, so Ananias, who was a disciple, not an apostle, departed and entered the house, placed his hands on Saul and said, brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, remember, Saul has been killing and imprisoning Christians up to this point. Immediately, something like scales fell from his eyes so he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, his strength returned. For several days, he was with the disciples in Damascus, and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying, this man is the Son of God. So the church had spread to Jews outside of the traditional borders of Israel. Now at this time, churches in places like Damascus didn't have any pastors or elders or any other acknowledged leaders in the church. They were under the guidance of the apostles and emissaries the apostles would send who would travel around, and they were being led, as Ananias was, by the Holy Spirit to do the work of the ministry of Christ. Now look at chapter 11, verse 19. Acts 11, verse 19, it says, Now those who had been scattered because of the persecution that took place over Stephen, when Stephen was killed, went as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, speaking the message to no one but Jews. But there were some men from Cyprus and Cyrene among them who came to Antioch and began to speak to the Greeks, the Gentiles also, proclaiming the good news of the Lord Jesus. The hand of the Lord was with them, And a great number who believed turned to the Lord. So this is the same situation as in Damascus, except here in Antioch we see the gospel spreading to Gentiles as well. And this is right after Peter certified in the previous chapter 
that the church was open to Gentiles. Turn to chapter, or scroll down rather, just to verse 22. Chapter 11, verse 22. It says, a report about them came to the attention of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he came and saw the grace of God, he rejoiced and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with devoted hearts, because he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a significant number of people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas departed for Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught a significant number of people. Now it was in Antioch that the disciples were first called Christians. Since disciples were spreading the church, the gospel, farther and farther afield, the apostolic church in Jerusalem started sending out emissaries to visit these churches, such as Barnabas going to Antioch, to teach, encourage, lead, and continue evangelizing. And Barnabas recruited Saul, later known as Paul, to help him with this work. Now look at chapter 12, verse 1. About that time, King Herod laid hands on some from the church to harm them. He had James, the brother of John, executed with a sword. When he saw that this pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter too. This is the first known death of an apostle other than Judas' Cariot. Now, this was about the year A.D. 47. So everything we've talked about so far has happened within the first 15 years or so of Jesus ascending to heaven. Now, look down at verse 17. When Peter escaped from prison, we see what he said in verse 17. He motioned to them with his hand, these are disciples, to be quiet. And then he related how the Lord had brought him out of prison. And he said, tell James and the brothers, in other words, James and the other apostles, these things. And then he left and went to another place. Now, we just read that James, the brother of John, was executed. He's dead. But this is James, the brother of Jesus. And we see here he's a recognized leader in the Jerusalem church. In fact, in Galatians chapter 1, Paul wrote that James was recognized as an apostle when Paul first visited the Jerusalem church after becoming a Christian which would have been about A.D. 36. So James is now an apostle too. Turn to chapter 13, verse 1. Chapter 13. It says, Now there were these prophets and teachers in the church at Antioch, Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius the Cyrenian, Manaen, a close friend of Herod the Tetrarch from childhood, and Saul, who we know as Paul. While they were serving the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So now we see prophets and teachers among disciples who were not apostles. And the Spirit led them to send out Barnabas and Saul as missionaries and church planters. But take a look in chapter 14, verse 14. It says, but when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard about it, that is, that the people in Lystra were referring to them as gods, they tore their clothes and rushed out into the crowd, shouting. So sometime before A.D. 49, Paul and Barnabas now were recognized as apostles. Look at, down at verse 23, and you might notice on the screen I'm developing a flow chart here. Chapter 14, verse 23, when they, that is Paul and Barnabas, had appointed elders for them in the various churches, with prayer and fasting, they entrusted them to the protection of the Lord in whom they had believed. So as they planted churches, the apostles, Paul and Barnabas, were appointing elders in each church. The elders would govern the church and minister, administer over the ministry of the church in that local area, but they were still under the authority of of the apostles. They were basically to serve the apostles in that local church. Turn to chapter 15, verse 2. It says, When Paul and Barnabas had a major argument and debate with them, that is, some believers who came to Antioch teaching false doctrine, 
the church in Antioch appointed Paul and Barnabas and some others from among them to go up to meet with the apostles and elders in Jerusalem about this point of disagreement. So a dispute arose about doctrine, and Paul and Barnabas went to talk it over with the other apostles, with the elders and apostles in Jerusalem. So we see Jerusalem also had elders at this time helping the apostles to get done the work in that city. The church in Jerusalem, which was led by James and Peter, which you'll see if you read the rest of that chapter, had authority over all the local churches, with the apostles being a ruling council at this point for the worldwide church. Now look at verse 22. So they get together, they debate, and then it says, Then the apostles and elders with the whole church decided to send men chosen from among them, Judas called Barsabbas, and Silas, leaders among the brothers, to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They sent this letter with them from the apostles and elders, your brothers, to the Gentile brothers and sisters in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia, greetings. So the church in Jerusalem, under the guidance of their own elders and the apostles, sent emissaries to other churches with a letter from the apostles and elders. Chapter 16, verse 4, shows that this letter went out to all the churches in this area, and the people were expected to obey the letter. Now, many of our New Testament books began as letters, right, to one or more individuals or one or more churches. And what we need to remember is that this letter and all of our New Testament books only have authority in our lives because they were sent by the apostles or their emissaries. Turn to chapter 20. Chapter 20, we're going to start in verse 17 and then skip down to 28. It says, From Miletus, he, Paul, sent a message to Ephesus, telling the elders of the church to come to him. And then in verse 28, he told them, Watch out for yourselves and for all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God that he obtained with the blood of his own son. So we see elders in Ephesus leading the church under the authority of the apostles like Paul. And I want you to notice the synonymous use of terms like elder, overseer, and shepherd. Okay? In the New Testament, elders, overseers, and shepherds are the same people. They're leading the local church under the authority of the apostles. Now we're going to leave Acts, turn to Titus chapter 1. If you're not sure how to find Titus, use your table of contents. Titus chapter 1. This is what Paul wrote. He said, The reason I left you, Titus, in Crete, was to set in order the remaining matters and to appoint elders in every town as I directed you. So Paul here delegated apostolic authority to Titus on Crete to appoint elders in all the churches. So not only were the apostles in charge, but they could appoint others, emissaries like Titus, to be in charge in their name, even to plant churches and appoint elders. All right, so let me summarize what we've been talking about so far so we're all on the same page. And then I want to give you a couple of surprises from the New Testament, okay? The apostles were in charge of the church, even as it spread throughout the Roman Empire. They had complete authority from Christ to define correct doctrine, to oversee the teaching and evangelism, and to administrate over the church and its ministry. The apostles delegated authority and responsibility to certain emissaries to oversee local churches like when they sent Barnabas to Antioch or Titus to appoint elders in Crete. The apostles also started delegating authority with matching responsibility in all the local churches to elders they appointed who were still under apostolic authority and represented the apostles by carrying out the work of the apostles in that local church area. Such elders were also called overseers and shepherds. So that's basically what we've learned. Now our first surprise. Have you noticed that there were no pastors 
in the New Testament. Now, as your only paid pastor, I think it takes a little bit of guts to point that out, right? Not really. Sometimes we think there were pastors because of one verse. Go ahead and turn to Ephesians chapter 4. It was old-fashioned church, right? Turning pages in your Bible, getting a feel for it. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. Verses 11 and 12 we'll read. Paul wrote, It was he, that is Christ, who gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers to equip the saints, that's everybody, the believers, for the work of the ministry. But the word translated as pastors in our English Bible is actually the plural of the Greek word poimen, which is shepherd. And we've already learned that the shepherds were the overseers, the elders of the church. The elders were what we would now consider pastors. They were doing the top-level ministry work in the local churches under the authority of our apostles, of the apostles, okay? Now, for our second surprise, turn to Philippians. Philippians chapter 1, verse 1. It says, from Paul and Timothy, slaves of Christ Jesus, to all the saints, that's the believers, in Christ Jesus, who are in Philippi, with the overseers, that's the elders, and the deacons. Who are these deacons? It's a bit of a mystery. This is the first mention, historically, of deacons in the New Testament history, and we're up to about A.D. 61. But, as we'll see in the coming weeks, Paul wrote not much later to Timothy, who by then was an emissary leading the church in Ephesus, about the requirements of deacons, which are very similar to the requirements of elders. So we conclude the deacons must have been recognized spiritual leaders who were in the local churches under the authority of the elders, who in turn were under the authority of the apostles and their emissaries. So there was a ministry structure. Christ was the head of the church. Nobody's disputing that, right? It says it right in Scripture. The apostles and their emissaries represented Christ and were in authority over everything that was happening in the church. The pastor elders represented the apostles and were in authority over the local church. The deacons represented the elders in the local church and helped them carry out the ministry work there. All the believers were carrying out the work of the ministry, including evangelizing, teaching, prophesying, serving, and giving as they were able and as they were spirit-led. And all of that was good. This was God's design, and it was working. But that's not the end of our sermon because we have one more question. What's going to happen when the apostles and their emissaries die? find out, we have to consult some other documents, early church documents that are not in the Bible. Now, these are not inspired by God, necessarily. They're not necessarily inerrant, and therefore, they have no authority over us. But what they are, they are historical artifacts that show us, shed some light on how the early church was practicing in those early centuries or decades of the church. And these documents show that the apostles guided the church into a ministry structure very consistent with what we just saw in the Bible itself, and also something that would be reproducible throughout the generations. So let me tell you a little bit about what's there, and you can take it or leave it as however you feel fit, okay? The letter First Clement is dated A.D. 95. It's from Clement, an elder in Rome, to the church in Corinth. And the letter shows that the apostles expected that the office of elder would continue with new elders appointed to fill any vacancies. Another document called the Didache, which means the teaching, which is dated even earlier, while some of the apostles were still alive, also says the churches should appoint themselves elders and deacons as needed. At this time, each local church in a city like Rome 
was unified under its elders, but they actually met in smaller groups in homes. So each home worship service would have one elder presiding and teaching, but then those leaders would meet together periodically and work out any issues governing the church in that city. Scholars believe by the year A.D. 200 that the church in Rome had... I'm sorry, scholars believe that by the year 150 that Rome had over 200 of those house churches by that time. The 4th century church historian Eusebius... And if you haven't ever read Eusebius' history, you might want to pick it up. It's easy to read. It's very fascinating. But he wrote that Clement, that I mentioned earlier, was the lead elder or senior pastor in Rome for nine years before his death. With the apostles and the emissaries gone, what we see happened in Rome was that one one of the elders was kind of elevated a little bit to become the leader of the elders to help facilitate that team. And so he led the team of local elders who led all the other uh, spiritual leaders in the church. And Eusebius says Clement was the third such non-apostolic elder in Rome. And even before the turn of the century, he had authority to write and criticize what was going on in another church in Corinth. In fact, if you read this letter, 1 Clement, you see it's very similar to Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. The same problems were persisting decades later. Eusebius also pointed out that Timothy filled this lead elder role in Ephesus when he was there, and Titus did so on Crete as emissaries of the apostles. They got things going and led the elders in those churches. Before the apostles died, they sometimes themselves would temporarily serve in a role like this, as Paul did during long stays in some of the churches he planted. James did in Jerusalem, John in Ephesus, and Peter in Antioch. We have other letters dating from A.D. 110 from Ignatius, who was the leader, the lead elder in Antioch, to several other churches. Ignatius repeatedly refers to a lead elder in authority over a council of elders in each city. According to Eusebius, many of those first elders were appointed and consecrated by the apostles themselves before they died, suggesting they were to carry on the work of the apostles. We see this also in the writings of Irenaeus, who became the lead elder in Lyon in the second century, and still other writings point to lead elders presiding over a team of elders in churches throughout the empire. So within a few decades, we see a pattern from Lyon in France to Rome to Ephesus in Turkey to Antioch in Syria to Jerusalem and around to Alexandria in Egypt. And both Ignatius and Eusebius state that this pattern developed throughout the early church including Jerusalem, to have a senior pastor or lead elder shepherding a team of other elders in the local church who would then lead the church with the help of deacons. I studied under Michael Spiegel. He's a department head of the theology department in DTS, Dallas Seminary. He argues that since this system was so widespread so soon after the death of the apostles that it must have come by their initiative as a continuation of what they wrote in the New Testament. And they must have set it up under God's direction. Okay, like I said, you can take that part or leave it because it's not Scripture. But it is consistent with what we just saw develop throughout Scripture. So at this time, each city's church was independent, although they were accountable to each other. And each lead elder was part of a federation of equals who also would be accountable to each other. And all the churches, the lead elders, the other elders, and every believer was accountable to Scripture, including the New Testament, which was written by apostolic authority. So, that's the knowledge part of the sermon, the bulk of it, I assure you. But now we have to consider, is this important for us to know? You don't have to turn there. I put this one on the screen if you want to look there. But after describing the criteria for elders and deacons, this is what Paul wrote. Right after that, he said in 1 Timothy, I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these instructions to you in case I'm delayed to let you know how people ought to conduct themselves in the household of God because it is the church of the living God, the support and bulwark of the truth. Now, it can be confusing as we look around and see the many different ways that churches govern themselves today. But Paul wanted Timothy to know that God had a plan for the administration of the church. 
And we can see that plan develop throughout the history of the New Testament period and right into the decades that were beyond. It should encourage us to know that God did foresee the need for ministry structure and that he provided the church with guidance to meet that need as it would develop over time, including a plan to protect against false doctrines and false teachings, false writings, through the system of apostolic authority. In case you missed it, that's really been a big emphasis of the sermon, right? Everything comes back to apostolic authority. The apostles set up a system of administration. They mentored key leaders in each major church. They sent emissaries to do the same. They provided the New Testament writings, all to provide the church with protection and to help it thrive. Our God is good. One more verse or passage, verse. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 15. Therefore, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold on to the traditions that we taught you, whether by speech or by letter. Here is our directive. We are to carry on the traditions begun and taught by the apostles. And it should be further encouraging to know that this church actually is doing this very closely. That was one reason I really wanted to come here as your paid elder or senior pastor. First of all, we are committed to follow the direction of the apostles who were under the authority of Christ. And that means that we base all of our decisions and all of our teachings on Scripture, supplemented sometimes in the decision-making by the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Second, we have one team of pastors and elders working together. Now, some elders are paid, actually just me, right? I'm paid in full time, and the other elders are unpaid in part time. But that's okay, because actually we see that in Scripture as well. I didn't point it out today, but it's there. The elders are the legal board of directors of the church, and part of my job is to help shepherd them so that they grow and they become more equipped, and they are effective in guiding the church. Third, we have deacons and other spiritual leaders who help the pastor elders carry out the work of Jesus, just as we see in Scripture. And fourth, we're committed to a ministry of empowering everyone else in the church to grow spiritually so that you can all do the work of God, the work of Christ. That means helping people develop into ministry leaders and helping empower everyone to do whatever work God is calling you to do right now. Because eldership, like any leadership in the church, is not about individual power. It's about empowerment of everyone else. So I hope it encourages you that we're trying very hard to adhere to the model we see in Scripture and what we've read about today. So this week, we've taken a big picture look at how the ministry of the church developed. What we're going to look at over the next few weeks are the criteria and responsibilities given in Scripture for each one of these groups. So next week we'll talk about what it means to be a pastor or elder. We're the same people. And then we'll talk about deacons and other spiritual leaders in the church. And then we'll talk about empowerment of every believer in the church to do the work of Christ. I hope you go away today, even though this was a very different sermon, mostly just reading Scripture. Nothing wrong with that, right? I hope you'll go away with hope and encouragement, enlightenment about God's plan for the success of the church's ministry and mission. Our teenagers jumped the gun by 10 seconds, but they are going to prepare our dinner, our lunch, and to eat theirs before they serve us. Let me pray. God, thank you for what you have put in the Bible and in early church literature that enlightens us a little bit about how it was carried on afterwards. Not many people really think about this subject, I think, of how you structured the early church and whether there might be some wisdom in following that model. To be sure, it is never commanded in Scripture that we must follow a specific organizational structure. But I think if you put it in there, if you've described it 
and you put it into place through the apostles and all the churches adopted it in the early church period, then maybe there's some wisdom in it. It's worth considering. And I pray that each one of us today would go home and, and think about that. Think about the fact that you didn't just... I mean, you organized the whole universe, as Leland said. Why wouldn't you organize the church as it grew? Uh, 2,000 years later, the worldwide church is a bit messy, a bit disorganized sometimes. But we seek to honor you in this church, in this area. We want to glorify your name. And we ask that you would help us to understand how we can best be efficient and effective empowered ourselves, empowering others, and especially shining your light out so that we can evangelize and then follow up with mentoring and teaching to truly make, as Dell said, disciples of Christ, resilient, reproducing disciples of Christ. We thank you for giving us that mission, and we thank you for the honor of being your people. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we've got a, two songs, and then a benediction, and then another prayer. One song? One and a half, One and a half songs? <laughs> okay. The point was just we're giving the teens time to eat, so we'll sing the refrain six.